Alright. Yeah, well, let's get going. Hey, where did everything go? Did I do, did I kill my software? Hang on. Uh, where am I? Where am I? There we are. There we is. Hey, there we go. Good morning, Happy New Year. Welcome to the eight o'clock hour, New York time. I predicted one year ago that today would be a big dollar day, so we'll take a look at it. With that being said, let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, never risk money, cannot afford to lose. Huh. Will that one work? Ah. Let's see. Was it off there? No. So you heard the disclaimer. Yeah, I think you did hear the disclaimer. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good. That's not bad. I was just going through the part where I say, you're the boss, I am a humble servant, let me know how I can help. Whew. A why earlier today, it's better for Johnny. So, we're going to move everything. Cool. So, anywho, uh, yeah, like I said... You are the boss, I am a servant, so let me know how I can help. There's plenty of resources, I do this every day, so please subscribe, and please like, please comment. In the description below the video, there is a link to my book, which is a resource for help. Click on the link. If you don't already own it, maybe you want to buy it. Perhaps you can leave a, a, um, a review. Is the uh, 2023 going to be recorded or live? Ahmed, what would you like? Would you like me to do it live or would you like me to just record it and pop up a, pop up a file? Which one would you like? Well, Ahmed answers that. Uh, let me say I also run a community called FX Bootcamp. If you visit fxbootcamp.com. It's extraordinarily expensive. It's $88 a year. Hmm. But if you could do it, I highly recommend it because it's the best resource I can possibly offer you that will help. Ahmed said uh, live would be better, allows us to engage. Okay, let's do that, Ahmed. Ahmed's decided, everybody, we're going to do it live on Wednesday. Okay, I will get you a link. I don't have a link, uh, but I'm doing a presentation tomorrow. It costs 10 bucks. I'm going to outline next year. Okay. Cool. And then in the description below, you'll also find a link to tradersway.com, a trustworthy ethical foreign exchange broker with fast execution speed, narrow spreads, and huge swaps. But ultimately, 
I recommend them because they earned my loyalty and respect. If you try a demo account, give them an opportunity to earn your loyalty and respect. Tradersway.com. So, is it true or is it not true? This is a binary question. There's no middle ground. Is it true or is it not true that I said the first day of trading this year, the U.S. dollar would be strong? Ooh, that coffee's hot. And if you don't know or don't remember, type in a question mark. Cool. <laughs> it's gone from true to very true to I would testify in court that it's true. <laughs> Burn doesn't recall. Wow, Burn. Oh my god. Yeah, it it to me that's so much more important than moving averages and oscillators and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you you have a crystal ball, right? So everybody made money? You had a crystal ball, you knew it was going to happen. Mm, that smells good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps you were in there. I probably said it 100 times to be conservative. It might have been more than 100 times, but yeah. Cool. So anywho, there you go. It's a good start anyways. And here we are. Let's, uh, let's go through this just briefly. The weekly swing says that's the projected high if you think this is going to fall this week. And here's the target. Okay, here's the projected low, and here's the target if you're a dollar bull. Pretty amazing, huh? Here's the projected high, and the projected low is here. It went even dr further, dropped even further. Now, if you are in my swing trading group or day trading group, we actually predicted this, meaning the pound would fall further than the euro. And you can see the euro is, you know, quite a bit different. But let me ask you that. Day traders and or swing traders, is that true? Do you, is that something that you know? That we thought euro and pound versus dollar would fall, but pound would be the first one? To, that you would take? <clears throat> Can anybody confirm that? That we're more aggressively bearish on the pound versus dollar? Even though Aussie dollar... USD CAD, Euro, Kiwi, all that kind of stuff. Like we, we're, we're, we're bulls on the US dollar versus all of those, but in particular, we're, we're picking on the pound, right? Yeah. Isn't that nice to just know these things? If you don't know these things, uh, I would recommend joining FX Bootcamp so you can be in the know. Why go through life not knowing these things? Anywho, we'll take a look. That's just uh, one good day in a series of many days. So does it, is it, is it everything? No, no. But we were looking at what, 117, 118 as a bottom. And we're, we're going to retest 120. So there's two or 300 more pips below us. 
So I suppose what we're looking at is we're wondering if this zone is going to hold. Okay, that's kind of what we're looking at. And of course, if you don't know what that is, I just drew it. But if you're like, what does that mean? Uh, that's what, what we're thinking. I, I was standing, you were there. I hope you had a happy and safe New Year's. Uh, Doug, it wouldn't specifically be pound, euro, and Aussie. It's specifically USD. <clears throat> okay, then the second part of it was we looked, and this was in one of the swing trading group meetings, we looked at all dollar pairs, and we looked at them fundamentally, technically, we used seasonality, um, and we looked at all of them. And what we decided was pound dollar is going to go first. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, JM. So anywho, uh, take a look. Can you can you see what I'm thinking? Here, let, I'll get rid of this one because that's no longer. And we'll take a. Can you see the plan, Stan? So you're like, oh no, euro dollar dropped like a ton of bricks. I guess I missed it. Okay. The plan is sell around 107. It's now 105 and a half. And the target is way down there at 91. No, Johnny. No. You know, I would have uh, launched it tomorrow, except I've spent my whole holiday weekend doing research for my annual outlook because you guys asked for that. So because I was doing that, I wasn't able to uh, do the other thing. It's just <laughs> so <laughs> delayed, delayed, delayed. So I'm sorry, but if I hurt you, I'll make wine from your tears. So you'll have to Google it. It's in excess. So no. So busy. Yep. Okay, so anywho, Euro has lots of room to the downside. I mean, we need a lot of things to kick in first. Uh, so it might be happening now. It might take a little bit, so I wouldn't get too excited. And what I've pointed out is Aussie, CAD, and Pound have already hit their targets for the week. The week's already over. Morning, JGB. Okay, so there is dollar strength. Makes me happy. Happy. Okay, and oddly, gold went the other way. Very interesting. Oh, I did. Thank you, JGB. Hope you did too. I went for a nice hike yesterday.
It was nice to, to be out in nature, get nurtured in nature. I'll show you a picture. Look at this picture I took. Cool, right? I'll show you. Look at this one. <laughs> It's a full-size tree. Look at all that granite. Yeah. Boo -doo 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 -doo. So anyways, uh, dollar strong, but gold strong, huh? Or maybe just everything else is weak relative to the dollar. That's interesting. Mm. Bitcoin. Drop into a smaller time frame. And I think we should probably, you know, start marking some of these lowest lows. I think it was here. Last tree on earth. I should have put a for sale sign on it. Huh? <clears throat> look, look at the price that we're at here on Bitcoin. Just interesting. I mean, you almost have to mark that too, huh? So it's not really giving us any information. Now, stock market futures are up. We'll see if it'll be an up day or not. Oh, I was going to get you the link to sign up for the event tomorrow. Let's see, is it this one? Yeah. Okay. This will be tomorrow for the one year outlook. that over mm -hmm. okay so yeah going back to here I think I'll just draw this around could we have an update or several updates yeah for sure yeah for sure Okay, and then of course, my oh my WTI, we got to look at that. That's a biggie. You see, we got that triple top. You see, 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 see. So we were as high as 81, and then it dropped to 79, almost 78. Just a huge drop off the top. Okay. Burned is going to be there. Who's going to be at the uh, pre-market?
presentation tomorrow or watch the recording. I will post a recording. I'll put the recording up for a couple of weeks and then uh, and then I'll take it down. How many how many people are going to watch the presentation? The 2023 Global Market Outlook. Who's going to be there? Yeah. Just the, yeah, just the five of us, six of us. Awesome. Awesome, boy. Can I watch the recorded video? If you pay the 10 bucks, you got to contribute to my uh, Cuban coffee fund. Yeah, I'm going to be in Cuba on Saturday. Yeah. So, non-farm payrolls is Friday, and then uh, you won't hear from me until Wednesday. Yeah, Mado won't let me spend the money on cigars, so maybe I'll buy a fedora. I don't know. I don't know if that's Cuban. <laughs> You're like that's Panamanian. All right, let's uh, let's pull up the calendar. Let's do that. I know it's just a little bit of a tangent, but let's do that. No, the calendar's not working very well. There we go. Better. All right, let's just move this over. So anyways, thank you for uh, for attending tomorrow's event. I'm looking forward to it. I wouldn't have done it to be to be frank or blunt. I wasn't going to do one this year. But you guys wanted it. You demanded it. And uh, I, like I said, I am your servant. So I spent my holiday weekend doing that. <laughs> I think it's kind of, it's going to be interesting when you start seeing the facts. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is pretty interesting. Okay, so. Just going through, bup, bup, bup. we start getting some of the oil inventories this week. Although I thought that was AI, A, API, I thought API was going to get pushed. Um, but anyway, so that's what it says. Is that true? I thought that was going to get pushed to Wednesday. Uh, but but anyways, we'll see. Not not a lot really today. Okay, you can see like. German CPI has dropped from 10% all the way down to 8.6. Hmm. I mean, boy, huh? German unemployment, only 5.5%. Okay. But really... And this is what I thought. The calendar stops on Wednesday. Uh, not sure what's going on there. We might have to find a different calendar. It 
M4 money supply out of UK. Yeah, a little esoteric. Yeah, so anyways, for some reason, this calendar is glitched today. But let's... Uh, I haven't yet, but I will. Okay, I, I will. Uh, let me, let me go somewhere else and let's, let me try a different calendar. Mark's got jury duty. That's interesting. All right. Economic news. Let's see what we got here. So here's all that German news that's already come out. FOMC meeting minutes, huh? That's going to be definitely a read. Okay, we're going to want to read that one. Faux show. Earlier in that day, you're going to get the manufacturing PMI. You want to look at the, and it's interesting that they split this out or that we split this out. Um, the employment subcomponent is actually what we care about right now. And you can see anything below 50 is kind of like a negative mark. Okay. And it's the same thing. It stops on Wednesday. Interesting. Somebody's API is <coughs> shot. It just stops. It's funny, everyone's pulling from the same API. Anyways, look, ADP is on Thursday this week. And non-farm payrolls is on Friday. And so those are the things that matter most, most, most likely. Earning season's going to start in a few weeks. That's a big deal. The next Fed meeting is not till February, early February. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and of course, OPEC. Yeah. Yeah, of course, OPEC. Faux show. So we're really caught in a battle here when it comes to oil. Because you can see there's definitely an uptrend. Okay, but we're at the bottom of the channel. When you're down here, the uptrend is vulnerable. See, when you're in this position, it's more possible than otherwise for a change in direction. This is where seasonality would be an important factor. Okay, and to me, 
this is an this is still very much an up. Very much an up still. Very much an up. Oops. Because I'm not looking at it as a purely a technical trend. I see the series of higher highs and higher lows. But I also know who the buyers are. And I also know why they're buying it. And I know how long they're going to continue buying it. And I find that helpful information. I will, Moses, I will. I was even thinking about adding one more lecture on, you know, how to invest, what companies to buy. Like we talk about Schlumberger, for example, but maybe uh, it might be helpful to say, look, besides buying a chart, how else can you participate? The upstream, midstream, downstream opportunities. You know, very interesting, right? But once again, I, I don't have time, but we'll see. It's 16 hours. Huh. Everything seems... Fine on my end. A couple of people lost the stream. YouTube is telling me there's an ex excellent connection and that it's streaming. Happy New Year to you, Emmanuel. Really? It says excellent connection. Yeah. Yeah. Strange. When you're strange. When you're strange. People are strange. When you're a stranger. People look up and live when you're alone. Yeah. All right. Just said refresh. Man, my phone is on fire. So anyways, yeah, I, I think some of you are signing up for the presentation tomorrow. Be good. Looking forward to it. I'm going to have to work, you know, much of today on it. All right. So, uh, so anywho, uh, yeah, uh, fundamentally, oil should be up. Technically, it's getting dropped off the top. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Boy, that, that opportunity of buying it at 70. Remember, I had like, I think I had my limit order at $70.10, and I think it came down to $70.20. Ooh! Happens, eh? And watch gold. I mean, I guess one thing that's interesting um, based on much of what we see in some of the other markets, one might one might think this should be down. You know, be careful. Should is a terrible word in trading and investing. The should kind of in you know indicates that you're right and the market's wrong. Ha 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 No, the market's always right. But you could anticipate saying, well, if the dollar is strong, if it truly is strong, wouldn't you expect? this gold to roll over and so you I would wait I would wait is kind of how I would play that and you get sort of what this chart is telling me by the way okay if it did roll over this is an R1 so the rollover would look that like this okay man I got to adjust my mouse something's changed but my mouse is too fast I bought this super fancy, super expensive mouse, and it's so unbelievably fast. You 
can't use it. It's too fast. My keyboard is unbelievably fast and unbelievably expensive. So it's too fast to use. You just put your hand over the keyboard and you accidentally type about three keys. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> I, my most used key is backspace, backspace, backspace. <laughs> you got to start getting the cheap stuff. Works better. Okay. Good morning, coach. How can I connect Quantbox? You you pay for it. Let me give you a link. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So anyways, look at this mouse. It's just crazy fast. Whoa. Uh, Roy, take a look at exo uh, exotics. That's kind of what I was saying earlier. The dollar looks like it's strong. But when you look at exotics or when you look at gold, dollar's not strong at all. It's everything else is collapsed. And that would still make the Dixie go up because it's the value of the dollar relative to everything else. So if relative to everything else, the everything else loses value, then, hey, even the Dixie is going to show up. Uh, is it still on? Do you, do you have the link? I have not promoted it. Too many people took it. But if you still have it, I have to honor it. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't have it either. And they will never tear us apart. All right. So anyways, take a look at peso. The dollar was very strong versus Aussie versus CAD versus pound. But then when I look at peso, U.S. dollar is weak versus the Mexican peso. Isn't that strange? Ahmed says, uh, you thought it was relative strength of the dollar alone. Well, how do you calculate it? Okay, literally in terms of what? Okay, so you have one unit of U.S. dollar. And if... U.S. one U.S. dollar. So we'll do one unit of U.S. dollar buys 100 seashells. OK. And then a month later or let's say a year later, one USD. Buys one thousand seashells. Okay. Well, either the value of the dollar went up or the value of the seashells went down. But if you did one one thousand or one unit of dollar versus seashells, uh, goats. Uh, 
uh, uh, Udon versus um, Hammers. Versus bread. Okay. So, right. How about uh, legal fees? And so now we're creating a basket, basically CPI, right? And then you average it out, the US dollar versus everything, has the dollar gone up or down? Because what you're trying to figure out, did the dollar go up versus seashells? Well, you don't know if the shells went down or if the dollar went up. But if one dollar buys you more shells, more udon, more bread, okay, more units of legal advice, more goats, more hammers, then the dollar itself went up. Mujib, email me and I'll see if I can scrounge it up for you. I have every email I've ever received since something like 1997, whenever Gmail first came out. Do 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 Okay, so anywho, we're just hanging out here. The peso, the rand, but you see against the exotics, dollar doesn't look strong. No, I'm going to do stocks next. Oh, I know what I called the email. It was FX Bootcamp plus at Quantbox, wasn't it? I bet you I can find it that way. Yeah, no, I found it. I don't know if it still works. Uh, uh, I don't know if it still works. I don't think so.
Okay, but anyway, so there we are. Just a quick look at that trade. I'm now up 70% plus 260 pips. So my total return, right, is now 330%. Which ain't bad for two months, huh? Hey, Brew. Cool. Wowza! If you ever played F Far Cry Primal, they go Winja. Okay, let's do the stock market. Moses, guessing you're from. <laughs> you, be careful, dude. Be careful. All right, let's, yeah, let's do the stock market. Beautiful Uganda. By the way, I was doing some uh, research. I was doing some research over the weekend. Well, not just for the presentation, but in general. I was using Airbnb prices in Europe as an indicator of whether the European economy is going into recession. Isn't that interesting? And holy crap, pardon my French, prices are cheap, cheap, oh my gourd, oh my gourd, using Airbnb, if you find the beautiful location you want to go to and you want to stay in the best part of town, closest to everything, and you want to stay in a nice place, oh my God, it's cheap. I thought, there you go, eh? There you go. That's the impact of war. Hey, Darko. So anyways, I thought that was an interesting way uh, to analyze the economy. It also shows you that you know, there was a time when an American going to Europe would have to pay 30% more because of the currency exchange. And now it's basically one for one. So right off the bat, Europe relative to normal is already 30% cheaper. But I'm also wondering if it shows demand destruction. Oh, what, the Cuba? No, I do that th this weekend, Darko. No, I was talking about, uh, I did research uh, using Airbnb to look at prices around some of the touristy parts of Europe. And I was looking at the type of place you could get if you went to the most heavily traveled European towns and you were going to stay in a very nice Airbnb in the best part of town. How much do you have to spend? 1,000 euro a night? 800 euro a night? 500 euro a night? 
And uh, I thought it was crazy cheap. And I think in many years, if you wanted to go, you wouldn't even be able to get a place. Okay. Uh, I didn't go that far because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. Then I don't really have the data. But I guess relative to my sort of expectations... Darko, I don't have any time to talk uh, uh, for two weeks. Like, I literally don't have time. Uh, I don't have time. Yeah, no. Okay. So, again, sort of not. So, I don't have that. I could go back, Burned. But um, I just, like, dude, they were cheap. So... I, you know, I was looking at uh, places that are, like I want to go to, right? I looked at Venice, Rome, and Amalfi. Seems nice. A little bit of everything in Italy. And it was like crazy cheap relative to my ex expectations. So I'm just like, Holy, holy smokes. You're kidding me kind of stuff. Really? Like, oh, really? Because those places used to be stupid expensive, right? Like stupid expensive. You're like, oh my God, really? Now it's like, oh my God, really? So, uh, so for me, that just, it felt like, Demand was low. Europeans are not going to travel this summer. Maybe it's because of the, the war in Ukraine. Maybe it's high inflation. Um, may you know? So Europeans may not be traveling as much. So like, someone from Holland decided not to go see Venice this year. Yeah. So like Venice. It, like, yeah, yeah, anyways. So uh, that's one way of looking at it. Or the rest of the economy, like China is not going to travel this year. Japan is not going to travel this year. Um, that kind of stuff. Maybe the Canadian dollars drop. So, you know, you can't go somewhere expensive with the Canadian dollar. So your choice is maybe Cuba. Right. Apparently half the population of Havana is Canadian. <laughs> There's just Canadians everywhere. Canadians, huh? So like maybe this year they're like, hey, I can afford a three dollar daiquiri, but I can't afford to go to Venice and have a thirty dollar ravioli dinner that's basically microwaved. Right. Because that's the thing, you get to, to Venice and apparently like the food sucks and there's too many people and all that kind of stuff, right? But yeah, Burns like, yeah, the energy bill is four times what it was. I mean, that's very, very significant. Americans aren't there yet, okay? So anyways, I'm reading that into these prices and uh, yeah, crazy. So as far as the exchange rate, it's a good time for an American to go to Europe Maybe the dollar will get even stronger. Um, there seems to be demand destruction. So you can actually get a nice place in the best part of town in Venice. And it's not a lot of money. I mean, that's the thing. You're like, so I would have expected twice as much. Like, that's really what, uh, what I found. It seemed like, like literally half price. And some of that might be the exchange rate, but I think a, a lot of it is also demand. So uh, very interesting way to, to do research. Okay. Okay. Yeah, do the course, Darko. Do every course. Yeah, do it all.
Okay. Okay, so anyways, uh, DAX holding up uh, above our uh, support line. Okay, remember we talked about this. Even though we expect down, there's no way you can sell into support, and that's why. Okay. By the way, if you have other ideas on how to do indirect high frequency type research, let me know. So high frequency is not this regularly scheduled economic data by government agencies. But again, like me messing around with Airbnb, seeing if I can get a deal. So imagine like you spend several hours or let's say you spend an afternoon checking out, you know, what's available for traveling around the best parts of Europe. And, you know, you do Italy. And then maybe you do, you know, Paris, right? And then you do London and, you, you know, all that kind of stuff and see where there's excess supply. Maybe it's Italy. Maybe people are just not going to Italy this year. Um, maybe it maybe it's Italians and the Italian economy maybe is in collapse. Um, you know, but then, you know, what about Hong Kong or Shanghai or all that kind of stuff, right? And, you know, so you use Airbnb to check out prices around the world. Um, I can tell you, I, I thought I was going to go to Japan this year, but after two or three years of Japan being closed because of COVID-19 restrictions, suddenly the restrictions are removed and you find out everyone that has family in Japan is racing back this year in 2023 to get home and see mom and dad and the cousins and all that kind of stuff because they haven't been able to go home for three years. And so ticket prices from Atlanta to Tokyo are up 300%. And it doesn't matter if you're booking nine months in advance, there's no seats. Okay. That's right, Raymond. This is better for Johnny's schedule. So we're going to move. To the eight o'clock hour. Cool beans. Yeah, I, I asked and it seemed like a lot of people said it would help. That an hour earlier would just help.
Yeah. Do you ever look? I don't. I don't look, but uh, you know, I, I get. I know what it is, and I've used it, and I've discussed it at boot camp in the past. Many years ago, I subscribed to The Economist. Maybe I should redo it. Um, and so that's who who does the Big Mac Index. Right on, Highlander. Hey, you, you emailed me, right? Sorry, I don't know if I got back. I don't know what it was. I can't remember. I got too much going on. I'm bare, My head is about three inches underwater right now. Jeez. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so uh, I apologize if I didn't get back. I don't... I remember... I, I believe you emailed me, but I don't remember what. Otherwise, I'd just answer it. But by the way, like high frequency kind of research about the economy. I was watching uh, YouTube videos on traveling to Cuba since I'm traveling to Cuba. Makes sense, right? And I, without a doubt, got the most expensive hotel room in Cuba. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. I, I don't have time. I'm not going to be there long enough to like go see the real Cuba. It reminds me when I was in Johannesburg and Ryan's like, hey, do you want to go see the slums? I'm like, no. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> so I know I'm not going to get to see the real Cuba, but on a relative basis, like I, I have this beautiful room on the executive floor. I get breakfast. And tapas all afternoon and free alcohol. There's maid service and, and they press my suit every morning and shine my shoes every morning. And it's ridiculously cheap. Ridiculously cheap. But then when I watched this YouTube video, and the guy was only there like three or four months ago, so it's a pretty recent video. And he's like, he's, he's staying like a three minute walk away from like the, the best part of, you know, old Havana with all the restaurants and nightclubs. And, you know, like he's three, a three minute walk, according to him. Right. And he's staying in this Airbnb and it's a full apartment with a kitchen and everything. And it was $300 for two weeks. My like, dang, for two weeks. And I think it included a maid, where usually Airbnbs don't have a maid, but I think someone came up every every day or every so often and cleaned the place up for him. And it's just like, wah. Okay. And it shows you, well, is it, is it the CUP or is it the USD? Well, the USD is fairly strong right now, right? And so... um it's just if you can carry that out around the world, what you're doing is you're kind of creating a Big Mac in index. So I found Cuba obviously affordable. And then I found Italy like also relative to my expectations, like unbelievably cheap, right? And then you can start going around the world. Well, what can you get in Hong Kong? What can you get in Kazakhstan? What can you get in uh, Dubai? What can you get? And you start, you know, and you're like, where is the best relative value? And it's a way of doing research on the value of the U.S. dollar versus other things. You're, it's kind of, again, you're kind of making your index. Is the U.S. dollar strong or weak in terms of Airbnb prices? And well, what determines Airbnb prices? Supply and demand. Oh, Highlander, that's right. Okay. Chart install problem. Okay, so you either don't know how or the real answer is you run the auto installer. And so if, if you're running the auto installer and that's not working then you're probably missing a step like this. And 
And remember, I, I pulled everything off of an old site and put it on this site because I was sued by MetaQuotes. <laughs> Thank you, MetaQuotes. Okay, MetaQuotes sued me uh, or threatened to sue me. So I had to very quickly rip it off, rip everything off the, the MetaTrader site and pop it up on FX Bootcamp and just give it to you for free. But I, I don't know, like I know there was videos explaining stuff. I don't know if that stuff's up there. I did it really quickly. So it's probably incomplete. But here's what you probably need to know. Okay. Here's what you probably need to know. It's going to ask you, where do you want to install the file? Uh, Johnny, actually, that's, you know, well, I think the place you're talking about is actually Miami. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm staying in um, the Hotel Nacional de Cuba. So it's very, very, very... Vladimir Putin was there just recently, but JFK stayed there. Winston Churchill stayed there. All the famous people of the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, even 50s, I suppose, stayed there. Uh, the, the biggest movie stars, um, heavyweight champions of the world, Rocky, what was his name? Rocky Macchiano, Macchiano, uh, you know, the best artist. Okay. So anyway, so it should, if you run the auto installer, I believe it does ask you. And what you need to do is go file, open data folder. Okay. And you grab that link. And you pop it into the installer and it does the rest. Yeah, and the best, yeah, and, and Maida, that's what Johnny's referencing. Corleone and Roth. Now, Roth backstabbed Michael. And that's what it's all about. But it Michael doesn't figure it out till like three quarters of the way of, of number two. There's a scene where he's sitting on a roof. And I thought he was sitting on a roof in Miami with Roth. But I think if you go back earlier in time, they they were in... They were in Cuba, right? And then many years later, then they, they meet again. And Roth indirectly confirms. And that's when they're in Miami. Because I think by then Cuba fell. And he realized Roth had set him up. Yeah, anyways. Jim's like, yeah, the video is missing. Yeah. Okay. There was a time when Cubans weren't allowed to stay. I thought that was interesting. I, I remember uh, Nat King Cole played there because he was there for the Tropicana, but they hired him to play, but he wasn't allowed to stay at the hotel because he was black. But all the old movie stars, Ava Gardner, all, all these very famous people of their time, Charlie Chaplin, uh, all stayed at this hotel. And so I got the, like, not, I didn't get it. I didn't get like the presidential suite or anything. You know, I'm just flying solo, but, um, I got, yeah, the nicest room, uh, on the nicest floor, right. The nicest one bedroom on the nicest floor of the nicest hotel <laughs> paid, paid the most amount of money and got all the upgrades and it was cheap. It was cheap. Oh, oh. Cheap relative to anything. Now, I once stayed uh, at the Burj Al Arab, which was beautiful. And that's crazy expensive. So I don't mean relative to that. I just mean relative to a Marriott. <laughs> relative to a Marriott in Georgia. Dirt cheap. Fredo. Anyway, so uh, the big one to watch today is S&P 500. I wouldn't be shocked if we had a few days of up. Because 
Remember, I believe much of the market is wrong. Much of the market, from what I hear in commentary on the radio and on TV, it's unbelievable. They manage billions of dollars, but they're guessing or they're wishing or they're hoping. And their answers are like very wishy-washy where I'm trying to train you guys. And I'm sometimes brutal in our swing trading meetings, right? Where someone comes out and they're like, this is what I think. I'm like, oh, I don't care what you think. Okay? I don't care what you think, especially if you're new to this and you're just learning technical and fundamental analysis. You're just learning how to trade Forex. You're like, well, this is what I think is going to happen. I'm like, why the hell would I care about that? What? So what do we care about? What's the facts? Okay, show me the facts that you've gathered. Okay, so, you know, so you have a bag of pearls and some string. G good. Show me the pearls and let's start threading them together and, and see. Let me know your thought process. How did you get to it a conclusion? I mean, I want you to write me a paper essentially, right? Of, okay, what's your thesis? U.S. dollar is going to get strong. Okay, why? Because ec economic conditions are deteriorating. Okay, how do you get to that how do you get to that conclusion? Oh, well, when you look at this, 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 and this, both lagging and leading economic indicators seem to be pointing that the risk is to the downside. And therefore, I see it more of as a, as a risk off play. And therefore, this is why I think the US dollar is going to be strong. Oh, okay. You see what I mean? Versus you might say, no, 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 no. I think risk on dollar weakness. I think the, the, I, you might say, I think my thesis is that the fear of recession is overblown. And of course, then you would have to then support your argument. Well, because of this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, and this fact. You believe we're going to hit either a mild recession or no recession and that too much risk is priced in and there's more upside than there is downside. And I'm like, okay, I might disagree with you, but those are some really interesting facts. You see, that's what I care about. Okay. Make sense? That's where we all want to be. I think it's dangerous for me and and I think it's dangerous for me and therefore dangerous for you to have this idea that you can predict the future. That's not what my presentation is about tomorrow. Oh, I will predict the future, but I'm going to show you how I got to the conclusions. And that thought process is much better than trying to be right. One of the things, the reason you have evidence to support your thesis is your thesis is a thesis. It's not a prediction. It's a likely outcome if your variables are correct. Well, what are your variables? And over time, you might find your variables are, have changed. Therefore, you can change your thesis. Where people lose money is when they their thesis isn't their thesis, but their obligation. You keep doing something because you know you're right. That's the issue. No. If you have good support for your thesis through quantitative analysis, let's say, if you pay attention to it, you might find that those those things that were supportive to your thesis change. Therefore, your thesis cannot be valid. It's invalidated. And the faster your thesis is invalidated, the faster you get on to the proper trading plans. And I'll tell you, 
your career won't be based on something as simple as your your return because good returns can end and and very often end quickly so you can be great for 6 months or a year and then be terrible and what investors are looking for is the reason you go from having a good year to a bad year is you may have gotten lucky on your thesis where you're like risk off okay and you start doing a bunch of things and it just happened to go that way. But then the things that made the market go risk off change and suddenly it feels like it's risk off, but the market's going the opposite way and you don't adjust. And so you have a good year being risk off, but then it goes risk on and you're still risk off. And then you go from having a good year to a bad year, and which means two years later, you got nothing to show nothing which what in sophisticated investors and I don't even mean like pension funds I mean like anyone that's invested in this asset class before is going to look at your track record and they want to see what you do in the trough how do you go from a, a bear to neutral to a bull or how do you go from a bull to neutral to a bear and that process could be three six nine twelve eighteen months how do you handle those changes from very, very bullish to not very bullish to neutral to neutral to neutral to slightly bearish to more bearish to very bearish. How do you handle that 18-month swing? The, and if you show you handle that well, that's where your bread and butter is going to be because you're going to be much more consistent. So how do you get there? You know why and you know the variables that support the why. And you're watching the variables so that you can change the why. Or in that case, the what? Are you a bull? Are you a bear? Or are you a neutral? And you know what to look for and you're watching those things. You see? And the rest, technical analysis is, you know, fairly straightforward. Okay? Like, how about this? If I thought I was a bear on S&P 500, okay, do I sell right now? No. So, see? It took me less than one second. Denise said, uh, she did her planning uh, retreat on January 1st. Never done anything like it before. Spent the first hour struggling with how to begin. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a couple of ways to, to, to begin. If you're doing a fundamental plan, it would be what will the next year be like? Bullish, bearish, or neutral? And you try to figure out. You start with your guess and then try to do some research to confirm it. And you might find as you're doing your research, huh, well, maybe as you do your research, you start to already invalidate your thought process. Now, my planning retreat was focused on finance. Remember, and, and, I, and I, I cover this in my presentation I'm developing to launch QuantBox, the super secret fundamentally based alert service. So one of the things I'm going to show you is how I st started trading Forex and later added to it. But when I first started trading, I didn't know anything about fundamental analysis. So I didn't, and so m even though I didn't have a formal education in finance, uh, you know, I ran companies and uh, I was an investor in venture capital. And so I was able to do something basic. Like I, I thought about it, like, what would I ask any startup to give me and like perform a cash flow statements? I'm like, oh, well, my Forex startup, because I looked at them it, like it's just a business, which was a big revelation to me. I took it took it from like a video game type mentality to oh my god it's just a business it's only a startup and I know how to run a startup so I'm like what would the first thing I want to see perform a cash flow statement so I'm like oh my god what an amazing thing I, I should do this 
So very similar to what I'm doing in Cuba, where I'm just zipping off to Cuba for three days to write a book. I zipped off to the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay and I'm like, I'm going to do cash flow statements. I just need to super focus. Like, I don't care if I spend 15 or 18 hours a day working on my perform a cash flow statement and other parts of my business plan. Strength, you know, I did SWOT analysis. I did key result areas, that kind of stuff, right? So I went through and I did perform a cash flow statements and it was really good, right? And so Denise might say, well, what would you put into that? And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I had to look at my trading results and all that kind of stuff. And I tried to look at averages and, and, I, and I built a spreadsheet where I could say, what's my average return per day? 15 pips, 20 pips, 25 pips, 30 pips, 40 pips, 50 pips per day on average. Um, then I put my average lot size. I put in how much I started with and I allowed, and then I'm like, oh, but I can maybe fund it some more or less or whatever. But I made all these variables. So how much am I starting with? Cash, okay, and year zero. What is my lot size per trade? What is my average daily return in pips, right? Because then I can go lot size times the value of pips in euro dollar. So a mini lot is $1. A standard lot is $10 per pip, right? So if my average pip, all that kind of stuff. And then I'd go along and I went through and I built a perform a cash flow statement going three years out and found out that, oh my God, I'm going to make $100 billion. I'm like, maybe I'm over leveraged. So that's why I got to the point where I went back and reprogrammed it so I can change my lot size. And then I found out I still made too much money at the end of three years. So I'm like, why am I ending up with too much money? So then I needed to change as my account grew, the per my lot size grew s more slowly. So if I doubled the account, Okay, my lot size didn't double, it only went up 66%. Or maybe it only went up 50%. Or maybe it went up 75. So I had to make that a variable. You see, and so you'd build this thing and go back and, and then have to add something and reprogram the whole thing. Then you found out you still didn't get the results you needed. Like, again, way too much money. You're like, well, way too much money means I'm taking way too much risk somewhere. And so you just went back and forth and back and forth. And it was so, so incredibly helpful to me psychologically. So I'll probably put this in the, the book I write about trader psychology because I, I, I found there were paradoxes like the less, right? So the other thing is how much do I pay myself? So if I, okay, at the end of the month, if I had 10% profit, well, first of all, is that too high or is that not high enough? And then of that, how much do I take out to pay the bills? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, well, the less I take out, the more money I make at the end of the year because of compounding. Then you realize, well, what if I paid myself quarterly instead of monthly? Oh, well, what if I paid myself just once a year? What if I paid myself 50%? What if I paid myself 40%? What if I paid myself 20%? What if I paid myself 20%, you know, every month versus pay myself 20% every quarter, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And you start getting all these different results. And I found out paradoxes, like the less I paid myself, the more money I would make. Then I found out other things like, oh my God, I don't need a home run. I don't need to take big risks and get huge returns on big trades to get to my goal. I just have to be mediocre all the time and never have a bloodbath drawdown. Instead, just be very mediocre for long periods of time. I will, as long as I follow the mathematical formula I put out in front of me, I will hit my financial target. I mean, think about how liberating that was to say, in three years, I will hit my financial goals. I just need to be mediocre every day because I know my lot size is correct. I know my averages are correct. I know the way I pay myself is correct. So there's no need to like hit home runs. 
because I got my math correct. It, oh my God, it was so liberating. It changed the way I traded. Okay. So, but that was finance focused. And I started, remember, I started quantitatively. So I'll show you how when I first started trading Forex, you got to remember my first Forex account didn't come with charts. So think about that psychologically. I would do quantitative analysis before I looked at a chart. So I'm going to explain to you, and I actually rebuilt a simple version of my spreadsheet that I used when I first started trading Forex. I'm going to show you that. Because I need to show you when I, because look, my super secret fundamentally based alert service is simply quantitative analysis of economic data. That's all it is. Quantitative analysis of economic data. It's right. I don't know if it'll make you a millionaire, but it's right. And when I first started trading, I didn't know anything about technical analysis and I had to open up a whole different software package. You remember it was 250 bucks a month to get charts and you couldn't trade on your charts. You would just analyze on your charts. You would just look at them. So think of my mindset of a self-taught person. The technical analysis was an afterthought. So I'll show you how to get there. And my fundamentally based alert service is very similar. Okay, it'll prepare you for trades, but it won't put you into trades because you still need to do technical analysis. It accounts, and by the way, accounting for something is quantitative. If you're like, it's, it's measuring numbers, okay? It accounts for technical analysis. So let's say it says the S&P 500 is bearish for quantitatively analyzing economic data. That would be the truth. It is simply math. But then you look at it, you're like, but Wayne, it's made a higher high and a higher low. And right now we're kicking off a one hour 21 and it kind of looks like it wants to go green. And it's a big buy day because it's the first day of the year. And anyone that got out at the last day of the year might want to roll over and buy in the first day. And I'd say, well, yeah, but it doesn't change quantitatively that it's supposed to be bearish. Quant quantitatively, that is that. It's right. It's always right. It's 100% right. But remember, there's more things that go into trading than quantitative analysis. Otherwise, you would just plug in a computer and it would print money. Right? You see? Then you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't need a chart. So you have to ask, well, if traders and investors have quantitatively made investment decisions for thousands of years, then why were charts invented? To refine your analysis, but not to make your analysis, you see? So if quantitatively this is supposed to fall, and one of, th and one of the things that my fundamentally based alert service is doing is looking at the technicals and saying, oh, not now. Yes, everything says down, but not technical analysis. Cool. So now what do you do as a technician? Now what do you do? Well, you can buy it if you want, because you know, fundamentally, you know, technically this looks more bullish than bearish. You, you can do that. It's your call. Totally fine. It's up to you. But you know, you might be short term long. And the the, the quantitative analysis of economic data says this is more likely long-term short. So you can be short-term long or you can just wait for the long-term short. So what you would then do is go to the next level, right? And, and say, well, I want to sell this and it's not sellable now, but I could sell it maybe around here or I can sell it around here, okay? Okay. If I get a reversal pattern. So what if it did this now? Uh, huh, huh. You're like, Wayne, that's very bullish. And you, you said it was a bear. No, I didn't say it was a bear. 
And then you're like, oh, but your uh, your alert service said it's a bear. Well, no. If you do quantitative analysis of economic data, it's more bearish than bullish. But how would you feel if it did this? Well, that's why you get charts. You see? That's why you get charts. So you're ready, willing, and able, and you're using technical analysis now, and not only do you short here, but you short maybe for three months. Ha ha ha! Three months, and that's probably what you're missing, huh? That's probably what you're missing. You don't know if it's three minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks, or three months. So what I've found is, even though I've been preaching how to do quantitative analysis of economic data for 20 years, it's very, 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 very difficult for people to learn to do it. So you're, you end up being like Denise, where you're like, she goes off and does a planning retreat, which is 99.5% of people just don't do it. So she's already in the top one half of 1%. But then she gets there like, well, now what the heck do I do? How do I do quantitative analysis of economic data for every country in the world? And then predict how to do the entire year. It's very difficult, especially if you don't have an economics degree in 20 years of experience. I know in my first planning retreat, I didn't do that either. I wasn't capable. I couldn't have done it, nor would I even have thought to have done it. I just wasn't ready. I, you know, right? So that's why, wouldn't it be cool if you had an algorithm do it for you? Not j the algorithm gathers all the relevant information, but then does the quantitative analysis. And then it does the comparative analysis. And you're like, oh, that's so much, that's so helpful. So then what you're left for is you, right? That your RWA for the rollover. And the worst case scenario is something changes in the market and it's not economic. And by the way, it happens. So the economic doesn't change, but for whatever reason, everybody's buying the S&P 500 because maybe Jay Powell said something. Is Jay Powell saying something quantitatable? Is it quantitative? No, it's subjective, especially if people's opinions of what Jay Powell was saying. So it doesn't change inflation. It doesn't change GDP, but it'll change the technical analysis of suddenly we get there. So you never get your sell. But the thing is, this is why you're a technician. This is why you learn technical analysis. If quantitatively everything says down, except the technicals, of course, then you sit and you wait, but you never get technical analysis. You never get the sell. Because you know, as a bear, you never sell an uptrend. I don't care how much conviction you have for a downtrend. If you sell an uptrend, there's a level of arrogance to your trading that says you're right and everybody else is wrong. Nobody ever cares about right or wrong. Okay? Okay. You know, there is no right or wrong. So in a situation like that, I would suggest if there, if you understand why the S&P 500 is going down when, quote unquote, it should fall, and you're like, well, it's something that the Fed said, which is a game changer in sentiment, then you make the decision 
why you're going to buy when you think economically it should fall. And the why is sentiment. So you are now buying dips. Okay. Because that's what is happening. This it what is happening is right. Technical analysis will always be right. But it doesn't tell you, technical analysis very rarely tells you that whatever created the up has gone away. It doesn't tell you when and where often, when it rolls over. But most likely, or mo most importantly, it doesn't tell you, is it going to go up for a day, a week, a month, a year? Okay. So it'd be more like, if economically it should fall, but technically it's up, well, you buy it until it stops going up. But then when it reverses and now technicals say down, now you're on the free and clear plan because this then happens, and I, I can't fit a reversal in there anymore. But if if the technicals point down and, the, and fundamentally it's bearish, that's when you go for the home run. You see, that's when you go for the home run. That's when you hold, baby, hold. Okay? So if the technicals are trending up, but the fundamentals point down, you hold your trades like a baby bird in the palm of your hand. But if the technicals say down and the fundamentals say down, you hold that trade like a sledgehammer. And please don't mix the two up. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for being part of the community. And if you're in my uh, day trading group, I'll see you this afternoon at four o'clock. Cheers.